Just before we dive into today's podcast, this episode is brought to you by Bloomreach Engagement. Now, they're an AI-powered marketing automation platform that personalizes the online shopping experience for your customers. Now, Bloomreach brings the power of AI in three ways. Your customers' real-time data, the anonymous website visitors, and the Shopify data, so you know exactly what customers want, when they want it, and where to show it to them. Now, Bloomreach also enables Shopify companies to connect all of this understanding across all channels, so online, offline, including mobile, really to create the most personalized campaigns, engage in conversations with customers, you know, and most importantly, to deliver a shopping experience that's unique to each shopper. Now, Bloomreach Marketing Automation Solution integrates seamlessly with all of your existing tech stack. It aggregates data across the entire customer journey. And as I mentioned, it really empowers you as the founder or as the marketer really to act on all of these insights from a single platform. Now, the company has over 30 AI patents and serves over 850 global brands. So you can learn more ecommercefastlane.com forward slash Bloomreach or you can go direct bloomreach.com and get started today. You're listening to e-commerce fast lane, the podcast show to help you build, manage, grow, and scale a successful and thriving company powered by Shopify. Listen to real conversations with partners and subject matter experts as they share proven practical strategies, platforms, and the best Shopify apps to help you accelerate your business. The time is now for you to improve efficiencies, grow revenue, profit, and lifetime customer loyalty. Please welcome your host, startup founder and strategic advisor, Steve Hutt. Well, welcome back to e-commerce fast lane i'm your host steve hutt and thanks so much for tuning in today you know with so many podcast choices to choose from i truly appreciate the fact that you're picking today's episode you're going to gain a lot of insights and a lot of knowledge to help your shopify brand very specifically around one interesting product as under product search and product discovery which i think is super important from a personalization perspective so we're going to dig into a really really neat episode it's a product that i have recently learned about but we'll dig into that in a few minutes all these episodes for e-commerce fast lane are now available on pretty much every podcast app and platform now you know with the apples and spotify's and youtubes of the world but we're also now streaming live on amazon music so if you're a prime member and you like to consume some of your audio and your video you can actually listen to the show now on amazon music so you might want to check that out now for a deeper dive into all of our topics today, head over to ecommercefastlane.com. We'll have a landing page there for today's guest and some extended insights, be some extra links and things, resources, and be a little, spe- a little special bonus for our dedicated listeners. So today I'm excited. It's Sebastian Hooker, who's a co-founder of this company called Nimstrada, and that's N-I-M-S-T-R. ATA, Nimstrada. And so what they are is they really are, and I'm going to let him discuss it in a moment here, but it's a really, really interesting tool that really helps brands and people that are on a website to actually discover products that they're actually looking for. So for example, someone types something into search and it will dynamically in real time start populating the I can't even really explain it myself. It's such an interesting technology. The nice thing about it is actually powered by Google's cloud, which is exactly where Shopify is powered, moving from AWS over to Google's cloud a few years ago. So, hello, Sebastian. Welcome to e-commerce Fastlane. Steve, thank you for having me today. So this is really cool technology. I can be honest with you. When you came across my radar, I'm like, wow, okay. Shopify is powered by Google's cloud. And I've been around Shopify world and actually working inside Shopify for six and a half years. And so I knew the migration path over to Google made the most sense. There's, you know, there's two or three major players in, in cloud hosting, AWS being one of them. And Google obviously being, in my opinion, being the superior player, hence why Shopify made the migration over to them. And, and so I see that you're actually connected connected also to that and powered by Google's cloud. I find that really interesting because Google has a lot of knowledge around site visitors and their viewing history and all the websites they go to. And so it's quite interesting that they have this technology available and you've kind of packaged it all up now into, into a Shopify solution. So I just would like to talk a little bit about this, this solution specifically more. Let's talk high level first about some of the problems you're solving. Sure. So. Like you said, at at a really high level, Google has a lot of information. They've been collecting search data for decades, and it's what powers Google.com. So 
when you go to google.com and you type in a search and you see that, you know, prediction of what you're going to type, sometimes it feels like Google knows you better than you know yourself. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. those search algorithms are, you know, some people say maybe they're not going to be relevant when large language models start taking over the world. But for the time being, google.com as a search platform is still very good at finding information. And a couple of years ago, Google Cloud, which, like you mentioned, is where Shopify is hosted, it is Google's infrastructure as a service and, and platform as a service offering. They created a platform on top of Google Cloud called the Retail API. And what the Retail API does is it allows you to import your entire product catalog from anywhere. It doesn't have to be Shopify, but it allows you to take your product catalog and put it into this Retail API and then also feed it the analytics from your website. So when people click on a product or a category or add something to the cart, they scoop up all those analytics into the retail API and it takes the combination of your product catalog and all of those analytics and returns search results to the retailer based on the same algorithm that powers google.com. Mm. So this retail API is really kind of like a door into the google.com search algorithm but it's in what's called like a tenant of just your data, just searching your catalog data, but with the brains of Google. Ah, okay. Now it's that's much clearer now. So I was just trying to figure that out of exactly how it works if you're, but now as far as like being a tenant, so when you upload your stuff, are there any other underlying technologies that are being applied towards your product catalog? So generally it is, the retail API is made up of two components. It's been renamed a few times. If you Google Discovery AI, you'll see some of the former names. It was called Cloud Retail Search at one time. Right now, at least on February 20th, 2024, it is under the Vertex AI umbrella. Okay. So the Retail API powers two tools. One of them is the search tool that I described, right. and the other is recommendations. Ah. And recommendations are what you would expect on an e-commerce site. So frequently bought together or others you may like or similar items, those AI models can also be trained by the same data uploaded to the retail API. Ah, okay. Well, we're going to unpack that one because that's an interesting concept because there's a lot of, you know, like I said, I've been, you know, merchant facing for a long time in Shopify world. And, you know, that's one of the questions that a lot of brands have other than just using the built-in basic search in Shopify through your theme and what's being revealed, they, they feel there's not a lot of underlying data and they feel they're just like manually curated lists of products based on tags. And there's way, way, <laughs> way more exactly to search. What it is. <laughs> It's terrible, but okay. I want to talk about your, your founding story before I really start getting into the weeds here, because it, it just always fascinates me why people build what they build or what kind of, there's, there's gotta be a story behind being involved with this, wanting to build this not more than just a SaaS company. There's gotta be an underlying kind of story. So I'd love to hear that about you and your co-founder, how you met and kind of where we're at today. Yeah. So I've been in big tech in the cloud space for the last five years or so. I was at Microsoft for a few years doing cloud architecture for financial services and banks. And then during COVID, I actually moved over to Google and I had the choice to either work with financial services again or retailers. And just given the speed that some of these regulated industries run at, I thought testing retailers out would be really fun for my career. So I joined Google Cloud as an enterprise sales engineer. So I was the person on the phone who would answer technical questions or work with a CTO or their team to build out a proof of concept and show this is what Google Cloud can do for you. Here's why you should buy this. That was generally what I was doing for a while for retailers. And there, there was this constant product that kept coming up and that was the retail API. So retailers were interested in this because everybody is trying to figure out how to make Google search work for them from an SEO perspective, but there really wasn't a product to take the power of Google search onto a website and deliver search results on a retailer's website until this product. So I worked with, with some pretty large brands and there was always either a big consulting agreement or professional services implementation fee that came with this. And this fee was in the ballpark conservatively of three to five hundred thousand dollars if you used an external Google Cloud partner to do this. And if you use Google Cloud Consulting, it could be even more expensive. And this took six to eight months, give or take, to take a product catalog, build the ETL tooling, get those user events in place, build all the front end components to return it on the storefront. These are the biggest brands. These are the Macy's and the Home Depots of the world that use this right. that really partner with consulting firms to bring this to life. 
And what I was noticing is more and more companies were moving to Shopify. And Shopify is really going after that enterprise space now. However, these brands don't have those six-figure checks to lay out for some AI technology that may or may not work for them. So when I realized that it didn't have to be this difficult and we could kind of democratize AI by wrapping up this ETL tooling or this connectivity tooling inside of a Shopify app, I reached out to a, a friend and, and colleague of mine who I had worked with on another project about 10 years prior and said, I really think we could build an app here that makes this repeatable, that makes it DIY if people want to do it themselves, hmm. and that allows people to access the same AI technology that, that the big dogs use with the big budgets right. and just kind of build a fully managed service in between Shopify and Google Cloud that does all of the hard parts that people spend way too much money on today. Yeah. So interesting, eh? Like how, how this all happens. Cause like when, you know, when I think about search and discovery, as important as it is, I find that a lot of other, I would say notable peers in your space, which we'll talk about in a second. What's interesting is that a lot of them are kind of wholly owned internal tech. So they've kind of done their own thing. They're not leveraging um, other networks like Google to help them power that kind of search and discovery and through, like you said, through that retail API. You know, I don't need to kind of rattle off any names because you can easily go to the Shopify app store and you can kind of look for technology partners in search and discovery. And there's some notable peers in there that have been doing their thing. But the bulk of them, I think over time, they've been bolting on a lot of things um, to enhance their platform versus maybe doubling down and focusing on kind of what you guys are doing, where it's like, you know, I have a lot of context being inside Google, you know, and I think there's opportunity from the commerce perspective of this retail or discovery API opportunity. And that's what we're going to do. And that's where we're going to, we're going to excel at. So I just want your feedback on that. Is, is that truly what's kind of happening in the marketplace a bit where there's wholly owned tech and people are marketing that as being, hey, this is our proprietary kind of algorithms. If it's the Algolias of the world or Clayvu or whoever versus kind of what you're doing and leveraging power of Google. Yeah, so I, I think that sums it up pretty well. A lot of these companies are figuring out how to use those two letters, A and I, either <laughs> in the company yeah. name, in their marketing materials. The reality is they've probably been using machine learning for a long time mm -hmm. in their own product, but the market, customers, merchants, investors have all said, you need to embrace AI. So these companies have kind of are doing what they've been doing and maybe adding some some AI pieces to it. Maybe some of that is around merchandising. Maybe it's about enrichment. Your, your product catalog is missing some data, so let's go and enrich that with some generative AI. These are what I would consider maybe features that can definitely improve search results. But what's really unique about us is that we are not competing with Google on their AI capabilities. Right. And a lot of these companies are competing with Google on that. So Algolia is competing with Google. Boost AI is competing with Google. Search and Eyes, Fast Simon, there are all of these search and discovery apps out there that are building their own machine learning and AI tool sets right. to deal with search. And our thesis is that Google knows how to do search. So yeah, we're, we're not trying to really compete with them. We just connect Shopify to Google and let them handle the AI side. And we handle that catalog sync and the serving side. Mm. Let's talk about that because I think that's an interesting concept because there's going to be some early stage companies maybe with only a couple hundred SKUs, but then I think there's going to be some brands that are listening today that are running on tens of thousands of SKUs. And so what happens on the real time kind of inventory and pricing updates? Cause I, I'm just, you're saying it's, it's real, it's synced in real time. I'm just curious on kind of what sort of machine learning is built into Google or that can be applied with your solution to saying, Hey, when we're getting low on stock of this one, we need to stop promoting it near the top of search from within our website because we don't want to keep promoting something and then forcing to have some badge come up to say that, Hey, notify me when back in stock. So. Is there some kind of technology or rules, I guess, built into the solution to number one, make sure that your product catalog and pricing is instantly available in Google's cloud doing what it, magic that needs to do. But on the flip side, are there any rule based kind of opportunities available for a brand? Yeah, both excellent questions. And I'm going to take that into two parts. So the okay. first one I want to touch on is, is the real time piece. Okay. And there's one thing we're bringing in in real time constantly, and that's the user events on your website. So that's when someone clicks on a product, makes a search, adds something to a cart, completes a purchase. And all of those are feeding into Google's AI algorithms to train things constantly. 
It's training the search, it's training the browse or collection pages, and it's training the recommendations AI models at least daily. The other piece of the real time is the Shopify data. So we have the user events, that's all streaming in real time through our app. The product catalog data. If you've got 500,000 SKUs in your store, to sync that with any third-party solution, you've probably <laughs> seen this if you're yeah. importing with oh, yeah. uh, Matrixify or, yep. or any of those other apps. It takes Shopify a little while to give us all the data that we ask for. API they call say, limits? Oh, <laughs> yeah, they say, you want 500,000 SKUs? Come back in three hours. Yeah, at least. So <laughs> what we do is we do the syncing of the full catalog at least once a day or as often as we can. So it really depends on the catalog size. However, we, we talked to our early users and said, what is the most important part of your catalog data that needs to be up to date in real time? And it came down to inventory and pricing and occasionally merchandising updates. But right. primarily, people didn't want to show the wrong price anywhere. That can actually lead to legal liabilities depending on consumer protection laws where they sell products. Right. You can't advertise a price somewhere, get to the product page and show a higher price. Right. And the other thing is, is inventory. You, you really don't want people making a very high intense search, looking for a specific product and then finding the out of stock products. And that, that just lowers conversion. So inventory and pricing, we make sure is synced in real time. The rest of the catalog, we make sure it's there every day. And the way users are navigating the Shopify site, we make sure that's also in real time. See, so I'm on demo store right now. So just kind of walk me through what might happen. I'm on a discovery dash AI dash demo at myshopify.com. And so I just want to kind of understand the, the merchandising abilities that are available. So someone's going to go in because I know search is really important. I always tell brands, I said, listen, you can't hide this, you know, your search icon of your magnifying glass in the corner. Like, especially if you have a larger catalog, you know, there's reasons why Amazon has a really large search box in front and center or any other major player, Staples, Lowe's, because they're rattling off these major players. They always have a large search box. So they know it's important. And so Walk me through what I might see on a Nimstrata powered site when someone types something in, what sort of things are happening in the background thanks to Google? Yeah, so it's really up to the merchant in how they want to deploy our solution. We do offer like prepackaged app blocks, essentially drag and drop templates so people okay. can activate this same day. If they prefer to use a headless solution like Hydrogen, they can call our APIs directly and get that search bar to look exactly the way they want it on their site. But what we do is we follow all of Shopify's guidance in terms of the way we pass that query from the front end of the site back into Google Cloud. So if a customer wants to put a search bar across the front of their site that, you know, waits 400 milliseconds after the last word was typed and then makes a query, that gets fed back into Google Cloud and returns with search results. So those are really up to the merchant how they want to deploy that experience. We really follow, again, Shopify's best practices there, and, and we're not really trying to compete with Shopify's opinion on search. We're trying to enhance it. Right. But the other thing I, I did want to mention on the merchandising, this has come up a couple of times, because we connect stores to Google Cloud, there is a plethora of merchandising opportunities inside of the Google Cloud console that merchants have the full ability to own and configure to their heart's content. Mm. So an example of that would be if on this demo store, we have shirts. If we wanted to boost blue shirts, we wanted blue shirts to come up at the top of search results in all of our merchandising conversations. The product team says, go sell these. We have too many in stock. There are rules you can set up. They're called serving controls inside of the Google Cloud console where you can take any attribute that you've imported to the Google Cloud retail API through our app and boost or bury those results based on certain times of day, basically visitor attributes, like anything you want. It's very powerful, almost too powerful <laughs> to the point where we actually give the guidance of try not to overcorrect. We like to start with an A-B test. We mm -hmm. say, what's your current solution? What are you comparing us against? What are we trying to prove here? And then we use IntelliGems to do our A-B testing because they're one of the better apps today to do full theme versus theme tests. Yeah. And what we look for is, is there an uplift just by relevance alone? Like if, if you don't add any of your merchandising rules or anything you've done in the past, is the AI model smart enough just to sell more than you're selling today? I and see. typically the answer is yes. And mm -hmm. then as soon as we have the baseline set up, then we say, okay, let's test adding a merchandising rule. 
Because sometimes as retailers or merchants or as technologists, we think we know best and we think we know how customers want to shop or we want to guide them down a really specific like path to, to complete a purchase. Mm -hmm. But nothing compares to actually training on real data. So if people are typing in shirt all the time and always buying a blue shirt, well, the blue shirts are going to come up in the top left anyways. That's that's what you're kind of paying Google's right. AI models to do. If you go in there and say, let's put the blue shirts up first, you might be doing that correctly for the trend. But if something you know happens on TikTok or during the Super Bowl that makes red shirts really popular, well, now your search results are using this human created merchandising rule right. when they could just follow actual data trends from customers and adjust themselves. So it does kind of scare the human merchandisers at first, <laughs> um, but we, we really just point to the dollars and say, OK, you can <laughs> make your own rules, but you might not make as much money. Now, I went to the Shopify app store and I looked, I had some reviews there and one of them was Luzori. It's a kind of a handbag company. In any case, I just I typed in the word like in search Valentino, for example, and you know, it comes up and it defaulted to the relevance and it shows things in whatever order. I'm, I'm noticing a filter. So I have two questions to ask in a minute. One about the PDP page and how you deal with the product details and then the, our recommendation engine around that when you're looking at a particular product. But in this particular case, this is the search results with a filtered left nav. I've been recommending kind of filtered opportunities <laughs> over the years, different apps and things. But once again, back to your same comment about a merchandiser and manually curating a certain selection of product without using AI um, or machine learning to kind of make some decisions on behalf of the brand. So what am I seeing here now where the brand has made a choice of saying, if someone typed the word Valentino in and now they're looking at different things, now they want to filter down how are these categories and subcategories and designer type? They have quite a few filters, gender and family and seasonality and things like that. This is, you just brought up one of my favorite features of <laughs> okay. like Vertex AI search for retail. Nice. And what is so cool about these, these filters? So it's called dynamic facets and ah. on Lazuri, these are enabled. And what this means is they're actually letting Google suggest not only which facets to return to the user, but also which order to put them in. Oh, wow. So if you're seeing categories or a certain type of category at the top, uh -huh. when you search Valentino, right. that is because enough data has been collected. When people make this search, the first thing they filter by is categories. So if instead you saw price at the top, that would be a real leading indicator that these dynamic facets have been trained to show price first. So these are highly dependent on your product catalog and the data that you've imported and also the way users shop on your website. So this is one of those cases where if a merchant says, you know, I always want, you know, size to be at the top, you can create a control in Google Cloud and say, this facet position needs to be number one when anyone searches for Valentino. These are rules that that are really up to the merchant to decide if they have strong opinions over that. Mm -hmm. But the dynamic faceting is supposed to be clever enough to put the filters in the correct order to maximize conversion potential. And part of that comes with pricing. So if you see the price filter down mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. you'll see that these buckets are dynamic. Every time you make a different search, these price buckets are altered. And if you're a customer listening to this, you might be thinking, oh, this is why I'm going to spend more money. But the way that these price buckets are made up, it's, it's very clever. It's, it's always trying to group them in a way that tends to kind of nudge people into the right bucket to spend just the right amount of money for this store. And that's, that's really clever. So it's, it's a usability construct, but it's also trying to increase revenue per session for users. And I'm going on a bit of a tangent here, mm -hmm. but when, when this collects enough data, when you have enough text searches and browse searches, these actually become personalized. So you have a visitor ID when you're visiting this. And if you happen to be shopping, you know, maybe over and over again on a certain site, you'll start to see facets returned in an order unique to you, or you'll start to see search results in an order unique to Steve. Right. And that is where this really only tends to happen on, on like the largest customers because you need a lot of data to train the model this well. But all of this is visible inside of the Google Cloud Console to show you kind of what tier of relevancy you're, you're delivering. Is it popularity? Is it revenue optimized or is it personalized revenue optimized? And that's kind of that golden tier. Mm -hmm. You know what else is interesting? So I'm logged into Google Chrome right now. 
I clearly have a customer profile just because, you know, I'm, I'm a Google at work or Google business kind of owner. I have e-commerce fast lane. I'm logged into e-commerce fast lane. I'm clearly a male. Like all these details are there. When I went to, clearly this is a fashion company. This Luzari is more tailored towards typically fashion is more female focused. They do have men's collection. But when I type the word Valentino in, these dynamic facets are working exactly where they're supposed to be. Number one is designer accessories for men. And then the next one is designer bags for men. It's pretty creepy, huh? It's unbelievable. <laughs> like it's amazing, right? And so because, because, but if I was logged in in my, or if, I'm assuming it would be a different, I haven't checked right now, but if I was doing incognito and go here now and not have any ID associated to me, Google would just make its own decision, not knowing that I'm a completely an anonymous site visitor. But since I'm logged into Google Chrome, there is a certain amount of data that's being, that's flowing around <laughs> and it's clearly showing men's stuff. And because I'm a man. It's wild. And, and that is a concern some customers have. They say, whoa, you're sending all of my data to Google. <laughs> and we say, yeah, but the Google bots just scraping your catalog already. It, it actually yeah. uses the same Google bot to get search data off of your product page as the Google bot powering Google.com search. So yes, your data is going to Google, but it does stay in a very protected environment that is unique to your catalog data. So the algorithms are never trained across customers. Lazuri's Valentino search will never power net a Porter or Macy. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, yeah. it's really like why you don't feed sensitive data to chat GPT today, mm -hmm. unless you have one of those enterprise licenses where it's all, you know, yeah. kind of in a, in a protected environment for you. In this case, all of the data you feed to Google belongs to you. And again, that, that's kind of our business model. It's how do we make sure we're not taking the data from these retailers and providing a service? It's how do we give these retailers the ability to leverage some of the best AI created so far? So and then continue now to the PDP page. So I'm on sure. Luzuri's page now. So I decided to click to a denim shirt from Valentino. There it is. And so it's a nice PDP page and all the details. And under that, there's a section that says exclusive recommendations for you. And so explain what's happening here. If this is a, a different tool or if this is also Google's retail API or discovery engine working in, in play here, because what's shown here is actually is relevant to me and it's actually relevant to that, uh, that shirt that I just selected. Yeah. So. This is, this is all recommendations AI. This is Google powered through and through on this site now. And I'm glad you brought this up because you we're actually running an AB test with Lazuri right now to see which AI models perform best on their mm. site. So the ones, if it says exclusive recommendations for you right there, that is a recommendations for you model trained to optimize for click through rate. So mm. we are testing now, what are the items that we can show Steve that he's most likely to click on? Is it you know, a pair of jeans, is it a jacket, is it shoes? And then as we collect more and more data, so as like add to cart events happen, as we see, okay, when Steve clicked this, he added it to a cart. We're actually going to swap that model out for a recommendations model that optimizes for conversion rates. So mm. this really is a tool where the more data you feed it, the better the results get. And we kind of joke with our customers that the first day they install this on their store is the worst it's ever going to be. Like it, it really is all uphill from there because you're, you're creating this data set that's so unique to your brand and your users that these recommendations learn from, from shoppers who kind of shop and think and look and act like you to put them on the page for you as well. I see too, you're also doing it from within cart though, because there's the next thing we talk about kind of the, the proceed to checkout and then the, the kind of the, the upsell, the cross sell, the post purchase upsell. There's a lot of things that happen kind of pre and post conversion. And so just walk us through what's kind of happening here. Cause I add to cart. And then once again, there's some exclusive recommendations for you. And then there are also some social proof happening with their tool to as motivate people to want to continue the checkout flow process. Yeah. So Google Cloud includes several models by default. The first one is, is recently viewed items. And that's not really a model. That's just saying, Hey, we know you looked at this. So we're showing you, you recently viewed this. And that, that primarily exists. So you can see some data out of this on day one. Then they gradually get a little bit more mature. So similar items is, is the next most mature one that just takes your product catalog data and says, okay, we think these items are similar. If you want to show recommendations of similar items, here you go. 
Now, the rest of them that take the data to trend that I've been harping on, like recommended for you, others you may like, frequently bought together, these are, again, trained on the data. And what you're seeing on the cart page is frequently bought together. So each of these recommendations models also have a suggested placement. So if you're putting an on sale or a buy it again model, typically you can put those on any page. If you're putting like an others you may like model on, typically those are recommended for product pages. So what we do is we help merchants kind of understand how to train their first model, including the costs associated with that, because that is the more expensive part of this solution, because you are spinning up a lot of computers to train this. Right. But we train the customers to say, okay, if you want a recommendation on the cart page, that's the frequently bought together model. If we put recommended for you there, we're too late in the in the funnel for that to be a really effective model. So to kind of go back to answering your question, what you're seeing on the cart is a frequently bought together model that has been trained on data unique to that point in the in the conversion funnel. Right. This is amazing. This is great technology. And it's it's so neat that it's not, you know, I once again I'm I'm not trying to discredit some of the the, the years and effort that's gone into wholly owned internal technologies of of other technology tools for search and discovery and merchandising. But it's interesting to leverage the power of Google now and knowing that there's this discovery and this retail API, this vortex thing that you're talking about. It's just <laughs> it really is quite amazing that there are pre-built-in models that are ready to go, but then they're also the the and then you can help brands with that, with the selection of these sort of models. But then there's also some, you know, as an enterprise brand grows or has very unique experiences that they know is working, or they want to do some proper testing to what's working best from a click-through rate model or like, you know, from an average order value model. I mean, it's all different models, I guess, can be implemented. And so I have a question about Google Cloud. So so just so I'm clear, so we have the uh, Nimstrata app. It's connected, so kind of almost a set it and forget it almost. So you download this app, you connect to your store, your catalog is then synced over to Google's cloud. So then the next step, I guess, is they get the client, the customer, sorry, their vendor gets access to, or the merchant gets access to Google's cloud. Am I correct about that process? Yeah, you're you're spot on. So we really are that connectivity piece. We're like an ETL in that serving tool. You install our app, set it and forget it is a perfect description. We help you set up that connection to Google cloud one time. We help you get the schema mapping just right for your product data. And then you can see everything and manage everything in Google cloud. And our app is there for, you know, potential updates that you might want to make or different components for your theme that you, that you might want to experiment with. But generally speaking, what you're paying for when you pay for Nimstrata's app is that connectivity piece for us to keep your catalog in sync, to keep those user events flowing, and then to keep the search results, collection pages, and recommendations in the fastest, lowest latency way possible to the front end of your store. And if we go all the way back to the beginning of our chat together, and you were talking about Shopify being inside of Google Cloud data centers, we've taken a best effort approach to deploying our infrastructure as close to Shopify's infrastructure as possible. So the retail API is hosted on Google, Shopify is hosted on Google, and we sit right there next to them. And when we were doing our initial speed tests and going through the app review process with Shopify, we were able to measure that our search results are actually faster than Shopify's native search results today. <laughs> so, That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. And, and our goal by building this like fully managed solution was to make it as good or better than a customer could ever do themselves. Right. Mm. So it, like being a cloud architect from Google came with a lot of knowledge about kind of where to put this and how to build it. Right. And we just tried to build it in the, in the smoothest possible way to be that integration piece between the two platforms. Okay, so the next question is around app integrations, because I think some of the pushback that I get from some brands that I used to manage in the past was, hey, Steve, you're right. This sounds like a really cool tool. And I see the value of instead of the native solutions or other kind of like Swiss Army knife tool that I'm currently using, I can appreciate maybe this might be something good for me. But what happens with all the other apps or other pieces of existing technology I have if it's, I don't know, 3PL connections to a warehouse for fulfillment or I mean, I don't know, there's a lot of different apps, loyalty apps, review apps. There's, other, there's lots of stuff going on <laughs> on a lot of brands. And so yeah. how, do you, how do you play nicely with all of the existing piece of technology? Yeah, so we, we love integrating with other apps. And I think 
The simplest example of the ones you mentioned there would be reviews. So most review apps, when you install them onto your store, they create a meta field. So if you do reviews.io, it will create a couple of meta fields on products that say, you know, the total count of reviews and the average review rating. And then people kind of ask, okay, how do I get that into my smart merchandising tool or my search tool? And this comes down to our import schema. So Google's retail API has a very specific like way that they want that reviews data. And we just ask our merchants to select which app they're using, which meta fields that app is using. And then we map that data back to Google's retail API correctly. So there are a few common apps you've seen out there that that don't necessarily send the data in the way that we would want that. And we we go ahead and, and kind of clear that up transparently. So our goal is to really take the product catalog along with all of the other metadata in there that is provided by other apps and get that to Google Cloud's retail API seamlessly. Like if you're ever creating any kind of custom integration to get to the retail API within our tool, we would ask you to, to not do that and to call us so we can either you know build it once for everyone or get you on the right path. Yeah, this is amazing. So thank you for sharing that because I think that's uh, that's an important kind of thing to consider that the fact that you do play nicely and that you know this is just incrementality of how you're actually going to improve your business by having some AI powered, Google powered kind of search recommendation engine, and then having access to this uh, retail API or discovery kind of thing is just really, it's, it's quite impressive to be quite honest with you. And once again, not discrediting any of the wholly owned other brands and technologies that are out there, but it just seems, you know, speed's an important thing. And, you know, you mentioned how quickly you are in relation to Shopify's core uh, search functionality without all of the bells and whistles that you have and the integration framework you have set up by knowing this API. So that's amazing. I, I, one question I want to ask before we kind of wrap up is, is there, is there any case study or any kind of partner? I mean, obviously I looked in your, your app listing, but is there anybody of note that you've done some tests with and said, hey, Here's someone that learned about us, or they were an early adopter for your your platform, and they got they got integrated. And then, what does great look like after a three month or a six month trial with your solution? And is, is there anything you can talk about publicly about? Hey, brand X did this. Here's where they were. They were with us, and now coming out the other side, this is kind of the the success that they've experienced. Yeah. I mean, you were on one of our favorite customers okay. earlier, that that website, Lazuri. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm on there now. They were just such a great customer because they really took a chance on us when we were new. And when you have a new app in the marketplace, you realize that talking with Shopify agencies, talking with merchants, right. it really comes down to proof and credibility. Right. So we worked with Lazuri to really build that proof and credibility so that we could take these case studies and success into other conversations. And we are, you know, in the midst of publishing a couple more right now, but but that one was really exciting for us because we we took out Boost. So Boost AI is what I would consider maybe like a leader in the space. They've got a lot of installs. They've got a lot of products going through their solution. Mm-hmm. And we ran an A-B test with them over a few weeks and they saw a 38% increase in conversion rate mm. and a 40% increase in revenue per visitor. And this, this was mm. like, game changing yeah. for this retailer, 100%. right? Like they, they have become some of our biggest advocates and it's, it, it's pretty amazing. Like we, we were nervous, right? We said, okay, like if we're going to go with the King, like we better not miss, <laughs> right? This yeah. is one of the yeah. best, like I, I quit my job at Google to, and I really took a bet on this AI being really good. And I was just so pleased to see those results. Right. And I, I think there's just so much more we can be doing on the recommendation side mm-hmm. still. And there are so many other, other vendors out there where I would say just just try it because this won't be for everyone. This won't work on every product catalog the same way. Right. It doesn't work great on small catalogs. This is buying a Ferrari when you might need a Corolla. Right. But if you are using a, another app and you have at least a thousand SKUs, I would you know happily cover the cost of an A/B test just to show mm-hmm. like how yeah. how much revenue this can increase. It, it it really is fun to to sell this to customers because it sells itself, and it's very rare that you can come in and say here's the quantifiable number that says how much more money we're going to bring you and the incremental cost of a solution. Because we're not the cheapest, but we bring a lot of value. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's amazing. And so is there a public roadmap about kind of what, here's where we are today. Obviously you're tight and you're going to Google's uh, kind of uh, cloud conferences and you're tight with that whole ecosystem. But is, is there anything we can talk about publicly about here's here where we are today. Here's where we believe the product is headed. Yeah. So one thing that's nice, we are a certified Google Cloud partner. Okay. So we do have NDAs with them and we do work with the product team at Google to get this right. Okay. In fact, before I left Google, I I put 30 minutes on everyone's calendar there and I said, I'm going to go <laughs> nice. build this. I think you guys built a plane, but you forgot to build a runway. So I'm going to go try and build you a runway. Okay. <laughs> um, and they're, they're some of our biggest champions because they know that their product adoption comes with the ability to see that time to value shrink. Right. And we're out there trying to shrink that time to value. Okay. But to answer your question about, you know, what's coming, I am so excited for the future of conversational commerce. Mm. And I can't say too much there, yeah. but just imagine being able to chat with a product catalog. And saying, you know, like a generative AI chatbot you've probably played with, yep. like, can you show me some, you know, dresses I might like to wear in, in an evening if you're looking for cocktail attire or, you know, I don't like how gray that suit jacket is. Can you find me something a little bit darker? Right. And that's what's coming to e-commerce all around. We'll see kind of who gets there first, right. but I'm pretty bullish on, on the retail API. Yeah. Sounds like it. And that's, and that's uh, totally true. I've, you know, dealt with a lot of kind of customer service app companies, you know, the gorgeous and the, and the gladlies and, and the customer and these other tools. And they have a chat solution and, you know, they're connecting to chat GPT kind of doing their thing. And they're trying their best to train a lot of these chat models right now to maybe answer some of the most important questions or importing the whole product catalog and the frequently asked questions section and trying their best to have a hands off kind of, or at least a self-serve or self-drive option for customer support. And I think that's a good starting point, but I have a funny suspicion just based on Google's new search experience that's, that's being rolled out this year. Um, and yep. they're, they're, they're certainly all in on what they need to do with their own large language model and how that relates to commerce and the retail API or the discovery API. Yeah. And that retail API, one of my favorite kind of stories from when I was it was at Google is we we always did Black Friday Cyber Monday planning. It was a very big mm -hmm. event for our customers given how much they would have to scale up their infrastructure. Right. And we would say, okay, make sure we have enough VMs, make sure that Kubernetes cluster can get big <laughs> enough. And the first mm -hmm. one that we had the retail API using at scale, we had to call a different team. We had to go call the Google.com infrastructure team because we were hitting the Google search infrastructure yeah. like literally through like retailer storefront. So it was just like amazing to see on Black Friday, like this wasn't just spinning up, you know, all, all of these VMs, this, this was actually going to Google search and driving a significant amount of traffic. It just happened to be through, you know, retailer.com's website instead of google.com. Right. It's amazing. Wow. This is so cool. So there's people listening today that I think might be in the sweet spot of saying, Hey, you know what? You know, we're, we're upwards of 500 SKUs, maybe a thousand SKUs. You know, we're running native search or a different search tool. We don't know if search and discovery and recommendation engine is working maybe as best as it could. I know that you know, we kind of chatted in the green room kind of before recording. I understand that you would like to offer kind of a, almost a free AB test to say, Hey, maybe pause your current solution or pause the native Shopify solution and allow us to connect, you know, get the app installed and let's, let's do a test. So can you talk to our listeners about kind of what you want to offer if they kind of qualify? Absolutely. So if, if they have, you know, a couple hundred products, we look at about a thousand SKUs where we see this being cost effective. Your average price of an item should also be more than $10. If you're just selling, you know, tiny, cheaper widgets, <laughs> you're going to be paying more to train an AI model than you would selling enough widgets to make up for that. Fair enough. So we do look for, you know, larger catalogs where search is hard. And if you've spent a lot of time configuring an existing tool already, that sunk cost fallacy can lead to someone saying, oh, I don't even know if I want to try anything else because we spent so long getting this tool right. This is maybe our peak. I would say, you know, just mention the e-commerce fast lane podcast if you book a demo on our site and we will run a free AB test with you for up to 30 days where we cover the cost of our app. We'll cover the cost of Google Cloud too. We have as a partner, we have some credits that we can apply to your account as well and we'll cover the cost of that. And if it works, then we can talk about what transitioning to our solution would look like. And if it doesn't, you uninstall it. This really is kind of a, a no risk way to see how much more revenue you could be driving from product discovery. 
And ideally, we work with you on on an ROI or total cost of ownership calculator to show, you know, for an incremental X dollars, here's, you know, the 100X that we're bringing you. Right. Yeah, that makes total sense, though. And like, you're right. And like, <laughs> you don't know what you don't know. So that's the thing that I would say to the listeners today is that, hey, you know what, if you're not sure that this is right for you, it is affordable in the end when the ROI can be proved. So it's like, and it's no charge to test it. And so I'm going to make sure I have details in the show notes for that. You can reach out to Sebastian or go directly to a form that we're going to have. I'll have ecommercefastlane.com forward slash Nimstrata listed there. It'll redirect to a landing page and then we can kind of go from there. But uh, this has been great. I've learned an absolute ton. I think this is, uh, you know, I have this joke every time, like multiple pages of notes. So it's life of learning. I, uh, I just really appreciate you coming on the show today and I wish you like amazing success with, you know, your exit from Google and the fact that, you know, hey, I'm building something I think really impactful and you're on the leading edge of what's happening in AI right now. And so this is great to leverage the power of what Google has, but let the Shopify, you know, mid-market to enterprise people actually get to enjoy the same technologies. This is amazing. Steve, thank you so much for having me. If this is a video podcast, I have a big smile on my face because <laughs> yeah. I, I tell my parents about this. I tell my family, it's hard to say, well, I'm kind of connecting these two things together, yeah. but, but you get it. Yeah, You've yeah. seen what it's like for these merchants. You've seen what it's like when, when they have the access to these tools. And it's just really been great talking to someone who, who understands the ecosystem so well. It's great. Well, I'm glad to, to share this widely because I think people just need to know what's out there. And I think that's kind of one of the reasons why I've been running this show for seven years is that I always get to learn something new. And today's like <laughs> no exception. It's like, wow, this is what's actually going on. This is amazing. And so I, you know, once again, Sebastian, thank you for coming on the show. Nimstrada.com. You can go check them out. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, Steve. Have a great afternoon. All right. Take care. Well, that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank you personally for being a loyal listener of e-commerce Fastlane. It's my hope that this podcast is offering you a ton of value through growth strategies, tactics, and exclusive insider tips on the best Shopify apps and marketing platforms, all with my personal goal to help you build, manage, grow, and scale a successful and thriving company powered by Shopify. Thanks for investing some time today and listening to the show. I'm so proud and excited that you have a growth mindset and are a constant learner. I truly appreciate you and your entrepreneurial journey. Enjoy the rest of the week and keep thriving with Shopify. Shopify.